Welcome everybody to the very first seminar for MST Open Week, our Open Day, and it's on the importance of understanding Islam. Uh, one of the distinctives, sort of cool thing about MST is it has a long history of uh, missions and missional thinking and missional engagement with the world. And as part of that, uh, we have developed a specialist research and teaching centre uh, called the Arthur Jeffrey Centre for the Study of Islam. Uh, it's one of the leading centres of that sort around the world, and we train missionaries and uh, academics in understanding Islam and helping Christians engage with Islam around the world. The AJC is uh, very blessed with some excellent faculty, and one of those is Dr. Mark Jury. Uh, Mark is an outstanding academic. His original PhD was in uh, linguistics, at, and he worked in the University of Melbourne for a long time. Uh, he moved into pastoral ministry and there he's had uh, a lot of engagement, particularly with um, Persians and uh, people from Muslim background who've come to faith in Christ. So he has pastoral experience and um, academic experience. He's also a, a, one of the world's leading researchers into the Quran uh, and has uh, recently published a book that is changing the field there. He's an outstanding academic, a great pastor, a good friend, and we're very privileged to have him with us today. So a little roadmap for what we're going to do this morning. This seminar will go for one hour, we'll finish at 12. Um, Mark will speak for around about 40 minutes, then there will be 20 minute time of Q&A. Uh, you can post your questions in the Q&A box at the, uh, at the bottom of your screen. So uh, Mark, welcome. Take us away and um, explain to us the importance of understanding Islam for Christians. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, it's great to have that introduction and uh, it's a privilege to be sharing with you some thoughts about the importance of understanding Islam in our world today. Islam has changed the world. It's the second biggest religion after Christianity and it has had a profound impact on the map of the world, on the political systems, on societies, and of course on people's spiritual identity. It all goes back to one man, um, uh, Muhammad, who is called a prophet of Islam, who lived towards the end of the, um, it's, he lived in the seventh century and Islam started off um, about 600 years after, after Jesus. And Islam was extraordinarily su successful uh, in its um, expansion. And uh, I'll just to put up a map here to show you uh, something of the significance of that expansion, which is often not fully grasped. So Muhammad lived from 570 to 632 AD, more or less. And uh, immediately his followers began to conquer. And you'll see on that uh, map of the Mediterranean how under Muhammad, uh, basically Saudi Arabia and what is today Yemen was conquered. But then in the next um, 30 years or so, the uh, conquest reached into Persia and then uh, the conquest of Egypt and going across the, the southern part of the Mediterranean. And then over the next century or so, the conquest reached right into Spain and into the edge of India, into Afghanistan and up into what is now known as Turkey today. So really extraordinary successful uh, expansion. Now, um, the, the impact that this had on Christianity was enormous and hard for us to comprehend today. Um, in the understanding of the time, there were five major centers of Christianity in, the ancient, in, that, in that time, uh, just before the medieval period. There was Alexandria in Egypt, Jerusalem, uh, Antioch, uh, Constantinople and Rome. And Islam more or less immediately knocked out and conquered three of those centers. And um, they were overrun in the first few decades of Islam. And then 800 years later, eight centuries later, Constantinople was conquered. And in, in popular um, Muslim understanding, um, there's still one more to go, which is Rome. <laughs> and actually the Muslims did manage to conquer the outskirts of Rome in 1846, but they were, they were driven back and retreated. So as a result of the expansion of Islam across the Mediterranean, is uh, Christianity's center of gravity shifted from the Mediterranean basically into Northern Europe. Well, why did Islam expand in this way? Uh, what was it about Islam? Islam has a, um, a particular understanding of its 
of its um, of the human condition and of its own place in the world. Um, so in, in Islam, human beings are understood to be by nature ignorant, and the solution to that ignorance is guidance, and the result of that guidance is success. This is very different from the Christian understanding in which the human condition is basically marked by sin, uh, which is a relational breach with God. And the uh, healing of that is caused is through forgiveness and reconciliation with God and with each other. And the result is to be saved. But in Islam, it's a different understanding of human beings, a different anthropology. Ignorance sold by uh, guidance leads to success. So Islam promises success. And there's a lot about success in the Quran. And Muslims often speak about the need to be successful. In fact, the call to prayer um, that rings out from the minaret of a mosque every day includes this line, after declaring that there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, it declares, come to worship and then come to success, come to success. Islam offers success. And this is success in this life and the next life. And part of the success that Islam offers is dominance over other religions. There's a picture of a protester uh, in the US holding up a, uh, an image of the White House with the black flag of Islam. And he is saying Islam will dominate. So the Quran says that Allah has sent a messenger, that's Muhammad with the guidance, there's that word guidance, and the religion of truth to cause it to triumph over all other religions. And it also says about the Muslim community, you are the best community that's been raised up for mankind. You command right conduct and you forbid wrong and you believe in Allah. So what this is saying is that the Muslim community following Islam, according to Muhammad, has a divine destiny to command and forbid, that is to dominate. That It requires political ascendancy to be able to command and forbid the world. <laughs> Um, so Islam promises success, it promises conquest, and look for the best part of a thousand years, this program seemed to be extraordinarily successful. What happened was that uh, uh, Islam was expanding rapidly, uh, India was conquered, um, large chunks of Southeast Asia became Islamic, um, significant parts of Eastern Europe were conquered, Hungary, for example, uh, Spain was under Islamic rule for um, about 800 years. Uh, and uh, the, the program, got Allah seemed to be giving success to Muslims. But then the tide turned. And from the end of the Middle Ages onwards, Islam began to retreat. It was being defeated. For example, the Portuguese conquered Goa in India and took a, a toehold of Islam there. But uh, Christian Ethiopia was liberated. Uh, you see um, Christian forces or, or armies of Christian nations pushing back Islam and stopping the advance of Islam. The Russians fought centuries against the, uh, the caliphate in, in Turkey and gradually pushed the Ottomans back. Um, the, Napoleon conquered uh, Egypt in the 19th century and the British destroyed the power of Muslim rule in India as well, uh, which led to a Hindu revival in that, in that, in that country. So, the, the theory was that Islam would give success, but for centuries, Islam was being pushed back, and basically because of the technological superiority of Europe. And this caused a theological crisis, and the essence of the crisis was what went wrong? Why aren't we ruling the world? And the solution that Muslims came up with, Muslim scholars came up with over the last two centuries, is that the reason why Muslims haven't been dominant is because they weren't strict enough in following the guidance. And what they needed to do was to reform themselves and revive themselves and go back to their roots and, and get on track again with the program. And that led to what's called the Islamic awakening. Uh, it's the movement for the last couple of hundred years of Muslims all over the world to revive and restore Islam. And there have been lots of symptoms of that that we can see, for example, Muslim women veiling themselves, which was not very common 50 years ago in many Islamic countries. And it's now become the norm because um, Muslim scholars have said that's what Muhammad required. And this is part of the awakening, the restoration of Islam. There have been some really significant figures that have provided a theological uh, you know, driver for, for all this. And, and one of them is the um, Indian scholar, uh, Muslim uh, teacher, uh, Maududi. Um, he started off in what was India and ended up in Pakistan. And he wrote a really influential book called Let Us Be Muslims. 
uh, which is in many different languages. And he, he writes in this after explaining Islam, he originally gave these lectures to a group of um, soldiers, actually Muslim soldiers in the Indian army. And he said, whoever you are in whichever country you live, you Muslims must strive to change the wrong basis of government and seize all powers to rule and make laws for those who do not fear God. The name of this striving is Jihad. And he, he also wrote that if you believe Islam is true, you have no alternative but to exert your utmost strength to make it prevail on earth. You either establish it or give your lives in this struggle. So he was one of the uh, sources, of, theological sources of the drivers for the Islamic revival, the Islamic awakening. And, you know, this goal to reestablish the dominance of Islam in the world by reforming Islam and, and following it strictly has been shared by all sorts of Islamic revivalist movements like the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and for example, ISIS had this goal as well. They had the goal of ridding Sunnis from the oppression of the Shiites and the Crusaders, that is the Europeans, the Christians, and to restore rights, even at the price of our own lives, to make Allah's word supreme in the world and to restore the glory of Islam. So this is the Islamic revival. It's been extraordinarily influential around the world. So I call the first crisis of Islam the decline of Islam at the hands of the powers of Europe, sometimes through Europe colonization, but also through wars of liberation to set countries free from the dominance of Islam. And then there's the awakening, the revival response over the last few centuries, which coincided with decolonization from Euro European and Western powers. And this led to what it could be called the second crisis because as Muslim countries began to revive themselves and apply Islam more strictly, they created um, is re-Islamized societies, which again and again ended up failing. So the, the Iranian revolution in 1978 promised to restore Islam in Iran, but the result was the disaster and many Iranians now hate Islam. The Taliban wanted to restore a kind of pure form Islam in Afghanistan. It was a disaster. In Algeria, there was an Islamic revolution to try and re-implement Sharia, and it ended in a bloodbath. Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, promised that Islam was the solution. But after they got into power, the people of Egypt were groaning under their oppression, and they applauded the army when there was a coup to throw out the Muslim Brotherhood. Turkey has been trying to demonstrate its success as an Islamic power, um, but it's failing. The Sudan implemented Islamic law and um, the result was a genocide of Sudanese. ISIS is a well-known example of a failed experiment in creating a caliphate. Saudi Arabia also, which has a quite a strict form of Islam, has huge internal problems and many atheists are rising in Saudi Arabia. People dislike Islam. So you have this problem across the Muslim world that Muslim countries are not doing particularly well. I don't think Islam really is, is that helpful in that sense. Not, there's no real economic success stories. There's economic failure. There's a demographic bubble of lots and lots of young people in many Islamic countries without a future. And there's a spiritual crisis, the failure of the Islamic revival, which is causing uh, a lot of doubt and uncertainty uh, amongst Muslims. So uh, the world of Islam is in turmoil. It, it hasn't quite got its story right. It, it, you know, it's, its theology is very political and it expects to be in charge, but it's not. And its attempts to revive that have, have failed. At the same time as this, the fact is that Western countries have proved very attractive to Muslims. and that's part of the crisis in a way, a huge waves of immigration. And Western countries have often encouraged this because they needed more people to bolster their falling fertility rates and to keep them, their, their workforce up. Um, so you've got all sorts of walls coming down across the Muslim world. There's the, the wall of self-confidence about Islam's superiority and dominance, which has really got huge cracks in it. But there's also the barrier that, that was existed between Islamic countries and non-Islamic countries, because millions and millions of Muslims have uh, sought a different future in, in Western countries, particularly in Europe. And I'd, I'd like to just share a, a few thoughts um, about what's happening in, in Europe. So there have been really massive immigration uh, into Europe. And um, the percentages at present are, are, are interesting. Um, 
European countries with between 5 to 10% Muslims today include Austria, Belgium, France, England, Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland. And also in these countries, um, these at present fairly small minorities are growing very rapidly, more rapidly than the rest of the population. And uh, this, this injection of Muslims into Europe and into other Western countries as well has come at the same time as a loss of confidence in Christianity and in great spiritual confusion. You know, materialism produces a deep spiritual hunger. And we see in Australia, many Australians turning to the new age, uh, all sorts of Eastern spiritualities. There's, a, there's a, a hunger for spiritual connection. And so it's not surprising, I think, that in the West we find there are some uh, Western people who are converting to Islam and their testimonies are really interesting. Two in the UK, Lynn Ali, she said, I used to go out and get drunk with friends and wear tight and revealing clothing and date boys. And I think underneath it all, I must have been searching for something. And I wasn't feeling fulfilled by my hard drinking party lifestyle. I'm so grateful I found my escape route, that is Islam. I'm no longer a slave to a broken society and its expectations. And a, a young man, Paul Martin said, it's nice to think about people having one partner for life and not doing anything harmful to their body. I just preferred the Islamic lifestyle. And from there, I looked into the Quran. So both these um, young Brits, they, they're rejecting the hedonistic, materialistic lifestyle that they've been exposed to in a post-Christian Europe. And they're turning to Islam in order to find meaning and spirituality and also morality. So at the same time this is happening, uh, Europe and the West in general is, is, is um, very intellectually and spiritually unprepared to engage with Islam. There's a widespread belief that all religions are the same, uh, that people are basically good and societies are progressing, things are getting better. You don't really need religion in a way. Uh, there's also uh, a sense of post-colonial guilt in the West, which sees Muslims as an oppressed minority, as uh, victims. There's also an ideology of multiculturalism, which says that all cultures are equal and there's no real fundamental difference between them in the sense of how good or bad they are. That religion is not really a cause of human behavior, but it's a symptom. So in Marxism, religion is a tool. It's not an actual driver of anything. So there's a, a downplaying, a misunderstanding, an underestimation of the power of faith to shape society. Um, there's also a widespread belief in a post-Christian uh, Western world that it's not really what you believe at all, but how you believe. So extreme, extreme Islam might be a problem, but moderate Islam must be the solution to that. Um, there's also the influence of postmodernism, the truth is whatever you want it to be. Um, you know, you, you can make your own truth. Um, people often believe as part of that, that you could preach violence from any holy book, that that if people are violent in their religion, it's not because of the faith, it's something they're, they're forcing into their faith. And there's also a kind of Western arrogance that in accepting all these immigrants, that Muslims will just become like us. They'll just somehow assimilate and buy into Western values. And after all, all values are the same anyway, because people are all basically good and all cultures are much the same. So the, the, the net effect of all this is that Western societies have been really unprepared for the changes that are happening. And in France, it's been quite intense. Uh, Patrick Calva, the head of French security services, after a series of really grotesque jihad attacks in France, said this. He said, where is the spark going to come from that will light the powder, transforming France into an uncontrollable country where groups take up arms and hand out their own justice? Who sees a crumbling country where violence and vengeance alternates between two camps? where the spiral of attacks does not stop. I mean, this is a very disturbing set of questions from the head of French uh, security services. So we're in a time really of, of a great crisis. Islam is in crisis. The West is in crisis. Demography's, uh, you know, demography, demography is future. Demographies are shifting. Um, Christianity is struggling in the West uh, to respond to this and societies in general are. <clears throat> and I want to emphasize that these changes are very, very long-term changes. They're not, it's not sudden things. They're things that have been cooking for centuries. And they're, the, the, the direction of these changes, these spiritual challenges are, are occurring in a way that is bigger than one person's lifetime. And in the longer term will have very profound effects. 
I mentioned that, um, you know, in, in the West, Christianity has really been in decline. And in some parts of Europe, you could almost say they're just completely post-Christian. Um, we had some friends who are missionaries in Spain and um, in the particular town where they were, they said that they were the only Christian family in the whole of their children's primary school. There was no one else who identified as Christian at all. And um, people there is in Catalonia, in um, in part of France, that, that people there had really no knowledge, understanding or engagement with the Christian faith at all. It had, it had been lost in the last century or so. So um, we see this, this pattern happening in the West and then Islam rising as a significant spiritual alternative. At the same time, the gospel has been expanding. You know, um, when Christian missionaries were kicked out of China, there were less than a million Christians there, but now it's over a hundred million and the gospel has been expanding in countries like Nepal and in India as well. So the church is having a huge impact around the world, but, uh, but not so much in, in the West. Uh, there's, there's a shift there, but what's been happening with Islam is really interesting. I, I said that Islam had this theological crisis. There was an attempt to correct it through an Islamic awakening, which is still happening. And this has created a number of experiments in Islamic utopias, which have all turned out to be dystopias. And this is calling, causing uh, a, a crisis within Islam. And one of the effects of this crisis is many Muslims are doubting Islam. They're, they're actually leaving Islam. I've had the privilege of uh, working amongst Iranians in Melbourne, and we've baptized 150 or more and have led, been part of leading many Iranians to Christ. And what's struck me about their testimonies is many of them rejected Islam and, and the God of Islam first, because they'd seen its effects in their society. Many of them were born after the Iranian revolution. They'd grown up in this Islamized environment and they found it to be corrupt, intensely disappointing, uh, and they turned away from it. And that's one reason why they fled to Australia. Um, and when they turn to Christ, it's with a huge passion that they know that what they were in before was wrong. And it's been really interesting to see that because uh, it's estimated now that hundreds of thousands of Iranians have turned to Christ. But um, before that, for more than 100 years, um, a huge missionary effort to reach Persians, which is the main ethnic group in Iran, resulted in only a few hundred converts. But since 1978, we're speaking about hundreds of thousands and perhaps soon millions of people turning to Christ. So there's something really remarkable happening in the, in the house of Islam. And it's partly to do with this theological trajectory, the crises over, over this, um, this time. Well, I'd like to draw your attention to two books that have written about what's happening uh, in, the, in the Islamic world. And um, one is... Uh, called um, Miraculous Movements. Um, uh, and the other is called A Wind in the House of Islam. These are by Jerry Trousdale and David Garrison. There are unprecedented number of Muslims and former Muslims now turning to Christ, often where Islamic revival movements have really failed. Hotspots include Algeria, Africa, Iran, refugee communities from Syria and Iraq. The Iranian church is said to be the fastest growing in the world despite intense persecution. And, you know, in Germany today, some of the fastest growing German churches are made up of refugees from a Muslim background. And the extent of this is really incredible. Garrison, in his book, A Wind in the House of Islam, which was published already now a fair time ago in 2014, he identified at least 82 what he called movements to Christ among Muslims. Now, a movement is, in his definition, at least uh, 100 churches planted or 1,000 believers baptized over a two-decade period. So quite a substantial movement amongst a particular ethnic group of uh, Muslims, former Muslims to Christ. He said that there were two such movements in the 19th century. And... Um, I'm not aware of any movements before the 19th century. There were 11 movements in the 20th century, but there've been another 69 movements between 2000 and 2011. Now that's an exponential growth in the number of movements, two in the 19th century, 11 in the 20th century and 69. And that was just up to 2012 and now it's 2020. And this is all over the Muslim world 
in sub-Saharan Africa, in the world of the Persian influence uh, across the Arab world, in Central Asia, South Asia, and uh, Southeast Asia. Now, this is really a remarkable season, a remarkable season. And it's what's, what's also really interesting is to think about how Muslims are coming to Christ. What, what is leading Muslims to Christ? Um, people have done really interesting research into this, like what's making the difference. And they've identified a number of causes that are really worth thinking about and reflecting on. If you ask someone, why did you become a Christian or why did you turn to Christ? These are the things they say. First and foremost, they saw the love of Christians. They saw the way Christians relate to each other. And, you know, if you grow up in a Christian environment, you might take this for granted. But when Muslims see this, it, it can be very moving to them. I've seen this again and again with the Iranians. They're used to living in a fairly broken society where people take advantage of each other, where they rejoice in other people's failures, uh, where there's a lot of cruelty and corruption. And when they come into a Christian community, when they come into a Christian church and they see the love that people have for each other and they know how those Iranians would have been before they became Christians because they grew up with among those sorts of people. And that is very compelling for them to see the love of Christ. And one of the most powerful th things you can do to share the gospel is just to befriend a Muslim, to introduce them to yourself and your life and to reach out to them. That needs to happen really in epidemic proportions uh, across the world. Another factor that has led Muslims to Christ is uh, they're just over Muhammad, they're over Islam. They found Islam to be violent. Um, many of the refugees that fled ISIS, that fled I Iraq and Syria, uh, are very open to the gospel. And uh, so in the refugee camps of Jordan and of Lebanon, there are large numbers who are just desperate to find Jesus. Another factor is uh, encountering Jesus in the Gospels, in reading the Bible. Um, I had a friend, an Iranian guy, who became a Christian, and he made the decision in on Christmas Island in, in detention. And I said to him, you know, what made the difference? Why did you make that decision? He had a really tough life back in Iran, being a drug addict and suffered a lot. He has huge scratches on his arms, which I think came from self-harm. But anyway, he said, well, I, I read a verse of the Bible. I said, oh, what verse is that? I'd love to know that verse, you know. I want the killer verse that will convert people on the spot. <laughs> and he smiled at me and he said, well, it's where Jesus said that if a man looks at a woman uh, lustfully, he's committed adultery with her in his heart. And I thought, that's incredible. He said, I'd never heard anything like that before. He said, that's just completely different, you know. And he said, I felt I had to follow Jesus when I heard that. And it's actually a really profound observation. Uh, Muhammad said that Allah has put a bit of adultery in every man's heart um, and that women have to be covered up because they're a threat to men, to men's purity. You know, It's a very different attitude to women. And when he heard this, this verse of Jesus, that was enough. You know, He was touched by the Jesus of the Gospels. Jesus' message of love your enemies is so compelling to Muslims who are just over all the violence and, and the and the hatred and the hatred of enemies. Another factor is the Holy Spirit is at work. And many Muslims have experienced miracles of grace. They've seen the power of God and they have had visions of Jesus. Um, and, you know, I have never seen so, I believe in miracles, I've, I, but I've never seen so many as I have working amongst Muslim background believers. Remarkable stories. You know, one woman was praying for her mother back in Iran one Saturday night at church. I'd preached on the power in the name of Jesus. And she went before the cross in that church and just silently by herself prayed for her mother who had breast cancer, a tumor as big as your fist. And she was due for an operation that Monday. And um, anyway, this friend who'd become a Christian just recently prayed for her mother and her mother went to bed in pain that night in Iran because of the tumor. And the next day, the pain had gone. And so she, on Monday, uh, this was a Saturday night, and then that we, she was prayed for. She felt better on Sunday, went to the hospital on Monday. They did a, a, a full set of body scans before the medical procedures, and they found that there was no tumor. It had gone. And the week before, they'd been these scans, and the tumor was there as big as your fist, but it, it had gone. And uh, my friend came to me, uh, and uh, she said, you know, there is power in the name of Jesus. And I said, yes, there is. And, 
you know, we've seen so many movements of whole families coming to the Lord when they experience the power of Christ. Another factor has been people being set free from evil. You know, many Muslims believe in the power of evil spirits and they, they fear them. And it's a big part of Islamic piety is dealing with this world of the spirit world. And so being set free from evil, being delivered is uh, really significant for many, for many of them as well. So these are the factors that are happening. And one of the thing that really strikes me about those, the last things I mentioned, people seeing visions and dreams of Jesus, experiencing miracles, knowing the power of God to set them free, is this is a sign of the intensification of the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's like Jesus is on, on the case of the Muslim world. It's as if God is saying, right, 1400 years is enough. I want them back. And so after really centuries of very little fruit, very hard, hard won fruit, we're now seeing these massive movements of Muslims turning to Christ that's being driven along by the wind of the Holy Spirit, by, the, by Christ's coming. Now, there are, there, are, there are social and political factors that are pushing this along as well, the failure of Islam, uh, the available of information today. Muslims can find out for themselves in their own language what Muhammad actually did and said, and they can form their own opinion about him. And that's unprecedented as well, and many reject Islam for that. Um, also, there's the available availability of the gospel in satellite television and um, through distribution of, of tracts and texts through mobile phones. And, you know, the gospel can go into places that once it couldn't go to at all. Um, I have a friend who, who uh, regularly has a, a, a small group meeting in a studio in America with a few of his Persian friends, and they sit around and they do a small group meeting, in their, like in a home, and it's videoed. And then you have thousands of Iranians sitting around watching on their satellite TV, which is probably illegal in Iran, but everyone has them. And they're watching this and they're having church in their home, uh, participating in a church service that's being led by someone in another country. So there are amazing opportunities for the gospel today. I think we're living in an incredibly exciting time. Islam has in many ways spiritually expanded itself. It doesn't mean that there isn't more trauma and more energy left. There's still, you know, there's still energy left in the old school of Islam wanting to conquer the world. And we've seen the effects of that and very traumatic effects. Uh, but at the same time, there is a, a new wind blowing in the house of Islam and it's the wind of the Holy Spirit. And I think one of the greatest challenges uh, uh, in the mission fields today is to reach the Muslim world and to support the, the movement of the spirit that's occurring across the Muslim world. Um, I think one of the greatest, absolutely the greatest needs at the moment is um, discipleship of, uh, of new believers. Um, because what's happening, for example, in Iran is that you have um, this extraordinary season of grace with many people turning to Christ after doors being shut for 1400 years. But as people come to Christ, there's, they have a need for healing of their souls. They have a need to be discipled. There's a need for a deep uh, liberation to take place in their souls. And you actually need healing of nations. And uh, there's, a, there's a great need for that. And that's been a core part of the work that I've been engaged with in working with an Iranian congregation in Melbourne is helping people to renew themselves, to be restored, to be discipled, you know, to be, become disciples of Jesus. And there are extraordinary opportunities to serve in the, in the harvest fields that are right across the Muslim world. This is a season and a time that God has prepared over centuries. There's momentum of forces of the, the work of the Spirit of God and also the collapse of ungodly ideologies that have been in preparation for for hundreds of years, and we are living in this time now. Um, one of the things I've been amazed in the journey, the incredible journey I've had over the last few decades, which has been partly academic and you know, affects our teaching at, at the Melbourne School of Theology, but past, past, uh, pastoral and evangelistic, is an incredible sense of privilege. Um, you know, it, it, it says in the Gospels at times, you know, that... Um, Kings and prophets long to see this day, the day of Jesus Christ. They, they, they sensed it's coming. And they've been missionaries to the Islamic world for centuries, and they long to see this day too. And, and I've often thought, you know, who are we that we should be living in this season of grace, this opportunity to serve? And maybe the Lord is calling you, firstly, to know more about Islam, to understand it, 
so that you can share the love of Jesus with your Muslim friend and your neighbor. And they're, they're not necessarily in another country. They're right next door to you in your workplace. But you need to be equipped. It's not good to seek to share the gospel with Muslims without understanding. You can share the love of Christ, but you're going to reach a point where you need to understand more. And there are some pitfalls. There's some traps in engaging with Islam. One of the challenges is that Islam teaches a lot about Christianity. Every Muslim comes to their conversation with Christians with uh, some presuppositions about Islam and, and how it works. Um, so you need to understand what that package is. You need to know where the points of opportunity are for sharing the gospel. You need to be equipped for that. And I just really encourage you, even if you're studying a degree in theology in, in another subject or another focus, you have something else on your mind. To be equipped for Islam is to be equipped for the world today. This is the biggest uh, spiritual force in the world outside of, of the church and extraordinarily important in politics and in geopolitics and in, in, the, in the makeup and constitution of our nation. Um, and it's a time of incredible opportunity and harvest. So I just encourage you to, to study some of the units that we have and to see whether the Lord is calling you to serve, to be part of this incredible uh, harvest that has been breaking out and that we're so privileged to be part of here today. I'm going to stop now and uh, provide an opportunity for, for questions. Um, you know, the, the things that I've said might open up lots of <laughs> issues for you and people have lots of questions. I mean, that's one reason why you come and study uh, at MST is to have those questions answered. But let's get engaged with that here now. And I'm going to hand over to my dear friend and scholar, uh, Dr. Richard Schumach, who will field the questions. Thank you, Mark. That was great. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the way we'll do Q&A is that you'll be able to post questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then I'll pass them on to Mark. So just, just a first question to kick us off, Mark. Um, what do I do if my Muslim neighbour is really nice? So you, you were talking about how Islam has a domination theology. Um, wants to take over the world in a sense. But how does that fit with the fact that my Muslim neighbour here in Melbourne um, is friendly and welcoming and hospitable and normal? How, how do those two things fit together? How many Muslims buy into domination? Well, not, not all Muslims uh, have drunk all the Kool-Aid, you know. <laughs> not all of them are, are committed to that cause. And I think what, you need to, what we need to understand is that... Um, as, as it says in Romans, God has put a sense of the eternity of his, his nature, his character in the hearts of every person. It's apparent in the world around us. And so um, Muslims, there are, there are two gods in a way at play and at, at battling for their souls. <laughs> One is the God that Islam presents, the, the actual teachings of the Quran, but the other is the God of the human conscience. And, and many Muslims are fine people and they, they have a sense of God as being good and loving and kind and they're, they're seeking that. You know, Ayan Hirsi Ali, uh, who's herself an atheist, said many Muslims are looking for the God of love and what they're given is, is the Allah of the Quran. But that, that, that figure might not be the one that controls everything about their life. They, they live according to a, a God-given conscience. So don't be surprised if Muslims are kind and generous and good people to get to know and encourage you to, to do that. But nevertheless, I believe the impact of Islam itself is, is profound and it does damage Islamic societies and it, it, it influences their course in ways that's quite, that's quite harmful. Um, but it would be wrong to assume that every Muslim is kind of a rabid, committed <laughs> uh, to, to the program of Islam at all. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Okay, just a follow-up question. Um, you've talked a lot about the Muslims who are disaffected with Islam, even to the point of um, hating it, turning away from it. Um, but then there are also Muslims who are like very, very strident, um, who have bought into the, who are drinking the Kool-Aid, to put it in your terms. Like, is the way that you, that we as Christians engage with the, those two, I guess, are more types, but do we engage with different Muslims in different ways? And how do we, how does that operate? And particularly, how does it oper operate in society? Should we be scared? How do we not be scared of some and friendly to others? See what I'm asking? 
Yeah, I think you have to combine love and truth. So you love Muslims with all your soul. You know, you you want to share the love of God with them as well. And you you think of them with love and with affection. But you also need to balance that with truth and understand that some aspects of Islam are really destructive and they, they, they destroy societies, they damage societies. So you need different strategies for different types of people. And, um, and also Muslims from different groups are at different stages of spiritual response as well. So many Iranians dislike Islam and they're very, very hungry. And you, you want to be quite direct, you know, with, with them. You, they don't want you to beat around the bush. But there are others who are very, you know, maybe some Arab groups sometimes are very touchy, very sensitive. They've, they have um, uh, strong negative responses if Islam is criticized. You need a different approach for them. And there are some that are aggressive and pushing their agenda and they need almost a polemical response. Like they need to have their, their, their ideological attacks challenged and answered. And look, praise God, God raises up all sorts of different people to connect with people in different circumstances and in different places. Um, so, you know, I think if, if you're more interested in the intellectual challenges, there's opportunities to get involved in that in apologetics with Muslims. But if your desire is to really love people and get along with them and show the love of Jesus, that's great too. And there are people that need that. The other thing I wanted to say is that, um, you know, Muslims that have grown up in Islamic societies are often more skeptical about Islam than ones that grow up in the West. It's very easy to believe in utopia if you don't have to live in it and realize that it's actually a dystopia. So, um, you know, Western Muslims sometimes are more passionate and more enthusiastic about this idealized Islamic society than people who've actually been exposed to some measure of it. Right, and, and I guess everything you've just said there just reinforces the need for Christians to better understand what they're dealing with, um, understand the depth of Islam and the different, uh, different mindsets that they, can, that they might be likely to run up against. Okay, we have a question here. I'm sorry, I don't know the name, but um, there's a Malaysian Christian here talking about particularly the Malaysian context where um, evangelism is illegal, where conversion is illegal, where pastors have disappeared. Um, how do you be Christian in that context? How does What does witness to Muslims look like there? What does building long-term trusting relationships, uh, displaying the love of Christ look like in that sort of context? Yeah, that's very difficult. Um, Malaysia is a multi-religion, multicultural society, but it's been wired uh, in such a way, it's been set up so that Islam rules and dominates. And indeed, Christian pastors have just disappeared in recent years, and we presume they've been killed. And the uh, investigations never find out what happened to them. And sometimes they're people who've been involved in sharing their faith with, with, with Muslims. I think that... Um, Christians in Malaysia have multiple challenges. One is to share the gospel, but the other is also to challenge the supremacy of Islam, to use what leverage they can in the social space, in the political space, to um, argue for a more inclusive society. And it's very hard for us on the outside to tell Malaysians that how they should live and what they should do. But I would encourage them to, even though it's against the law to... Um, to lead a Muslim to Christ, I'd encourage them to find ways of showing the love of Christ to their fellow Muslims. And I've had the joy of meeting Malays uh, who've turned to Christ and they need to hear the gospel too. Um, but the church there needs to make those decisions. That needs to be their call. And we can help them and encourage them and pray for them. You know, Malaysia is actually a really repressive society on this particular issue and they need our help. They need our governments to speak up for religious freedom in Malaysia as well. Uh, but, you know, I think Christians that say live underground in Saudi Arabia or in Egypt or in other places, they need our prayers, they need our encouragement and support, but we can't dictate to them exactly how they should, you know, take the challenge of the gospel to their environment. They need to let, they need to let the Lord speak to them about that. Got another question come in on a similar sort of line, Southeast Asian Islam. And I know this one's close to your heart because your research going way back, it was in Indonesia. So we have a question here about Indonesia. Um, it's clearly one of the biggest, if not the biggest Muslim nation in the world. And there's a very particular question. Do you know about um, what ministry is happening there? And particularly, do you hear about, you mentioned the 69 movements uh, of people coming to Christ amongst uh, Muslim communities, are you aware of that happening in Indonesia? 
Yes, Indonesia is one of the countries in which there have been mass movements to Christ. And actually, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there was one in the 19th century as well. It's one of those two movements. But yes, that is happening. And it's happening at a grassroots level. Um, it's happening. It's an indigenous movement. And the, the church, I was in Indonesia in the early 80s, and the church at that time seemed to me very formal and uh, influenced by European missionaries. You know, you had these in Indonesians in Sumatra going to church wearing suits and ties because that's what the German missionaries did. But um, in, in the recent decades, the church in Indonesia has become very vibrant and it's not illegal in Indonesia for a Muslim to become a Christian. You, you could experience persecution, but it's not, it's not illegal in terms of the law of the land. Um, and yes, the church is definitely growing in, in Indonesia. And that's one of the, I mean, Indonesia has hundreds of ethnic groups and languages, but the, some of them are, are turning to Christ. And that's one area of, uh, of great joy, really, in the harvest. Yeah, that's great. Uh, there's another question here, which is literally closer to home. Um, Paul is a pastor of a church, and 200 metres down the road from that church, there's a mosque. Um, and he's wondering if you have any thoughts about um, how to build relationships between church, mosque, Christians, Muslims, and presumably pastors, imams. Well, firstly, I'd say learn something about Islam and Muslims first. That would be really helpful. The other is just go down and have a chat with them and say, look, I'd like to talk about your faith. Can you tell me about it? And I'd like to share some of what I believe. Muslims are generally very interested in, in talking about God and about religion. Uh, they're much less inhibited about that than Western people are. And it can be quite refreshing. But my, my, my strong advice to you is to equip yourself first to learn uh, about Islam. And we hope to teach a, a unit introduction to Islam and Muslims next year that would help with that but then there are resources as well and you know we'd be happy to help suggest things that you can use to train and equip yourself but just reach out at the local level i think christians and muslims also can work together on non-religious issues you know what are the local issues in your community what are the social issues that people face um, employment effect of COVID-19, find out what they are find out how you can come alongside muslims and work together on issues like that yeah that's great um, you mentioned before, even within about Malaysia, prayer. Um, Ruth is asking a question here. What do you see as the most important prayer points for the Muslim world? If you, if you were to give us three key things that we should be, that we okay. could always be praying and regularly be praying, that would be great. Jesus said that he only did what he saw the Father doing. And I think there's something very powerful in prayer when we pray into what God is doing. So God is moving by his spirit amongst the Muslim world. So we should be praying for that to increase, like for the bushfire to become a mega bushfire, a, a fire of grace. I pray into that spiritual um, kind of fire that's burning and that, that would happen more. Second, um, pray for the persecuted church to awaken and to reach out to be a, a faithful and true witness to the Muslim world. Um, our brothers and sisters in Christ often suffer greatly, and but they have an, they have a treasure, and just pray that they'll find ways of communicating that. Um, the third thing I, I I think the greatest need really for the global harvest is is people to mentor Muslim leaders who've become Christians, Muslims who've become Christians, mentor them in discipleship. So pray that God would provide spiritual resources to help with the discipling of these large numbers of people's turning to Christ, that the discipleship will be deep, that the harvest will be brought into the barns and not rot on the fields because there's no one to collect it and look after it and care for it. Pray for the, for the Lord to provide, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, discipleship and, and, a, and a pathway for these communities to grow strong in the Lord. It's, you know, it's not enough just to have a ripe harvest. You actually need to do the harvesting and then put it in the barn. You know, there's a process. And that, that is really so important across the Muslim world today, discipleship. Thank you. Got a question here from Ian. Um, talking about, and I think this is common, where you talk to a Muslim and they say, yeah, and you even mentioned it, we believe in the same God. It's the sort of the Western idea. Um, although Ian's saying he encountered that in Africa. You believe in, one, in the same God that we believe in. Let's just not dispute things like how do you go 
get around that or through that to just try and describe the uniqueness of Christ or the distinctives of the biblical vision of God compared to the Quran? Well, what do you think is the sort of the easiest way into that conversation? Yeah, that's a good reason to study more about Islam because um, in a sense, the claim that Islam makes to worship the same God gives you a, a, a ground on which you can talk. But your challenge as a Christian is to share Jesus, is to share the God of the scriptures, of the Bible. Um, Islam teaches that we worship the same God. So the Quran says, say to the, to the Christian, your God and our God is one. That's what, that's what Muslims are taught to say. That's what Islam teaches. And the challenge is to, to get around that. So, because I think that the, the love of God in the Bible and the character of God in the Bible is very different from what Islam teaches. It's actually more the God of the conscience of the, of the Muslim. It's the God they want to believe in. And your challenge is to introduce them to that, your best friend, you know, the, the, the love of God. So I think if you're armed with a set of really uh, strategic questions, it helps. You can speak to them about your experience of the love of God and how do they experience that. Um, you can talk about the holiness of God and the presence of God. Um, I actually read, wrote a whole book on this called, uh, you know, um, The Same God, question mark. Do we worship the same God? And, and I include a series of questions. And those questions can really tap into people's spiritual experiences. Like, how do they experience God? Is God holy for them? Is God faithful? Does he speak the truth? Is God loving and, you know, it's, if, you can, if you know the right questions, that can open up opportunities to witness about your relationship with God. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, there's a question here about um, Arabic. So part of, the, um, part of the difficulty when you speak to Muslims about the Quran is that um, it's using Arabic and you have to understand Arabic before you're even have a right to sort of speak into the conversation? How do you respond to that? Well, most Muslims don't know Arabic. Right. No, they maybe they recite a bit of it, but they don't understand it. So it's not many Muslims that your superior knowledge of Arabic could be used in the sense that they would understand the arguments that you'd make. It's helpful to know Arabic, you know, and having that knowledge gives you authority. Um, but... It's, it's arguing about the Quran is probably not necessarily going to be the best strategy in, in reaching out to Muslims. So I wouldn't let that discourage you. I mean, Muslims try and discredit critics by saying, unless you know Arabic, you can't understand the Quran. It can't be translated and everything like that. But that's a smokescreen. I would shift the ground and I'd say, do you know who Jesus is? You know, have you, have you read about Jesus? Would you like to read the Injil, the gospel together with me? I, I'd move it to a different, to a different level than than um, trying to dispute about the Quran. Thank you. A uh, couple more questions here. Uh, someone, no name. If, if there's one subject that MST offers that um, gives insight into the, the particular stuff you're talking about today, what would you recommend? Well, we are preparing a new unit for next year called Introduction to, something like Introduction to Islam and Muslims, a title along those lines. And that will be uh, a really helpful, be a, a, you know, like a one semester unit that gives an overview of understanding Islam and also understanding Muslims. So that will equip you, it'll show you where you can continue and you'll see other resources will open up through that course. Yeah, cool. Come on, let me also mention Mark teaches, I mentioned in the comments, but Mark teaches subjects on Islam. He also teaches spiritual warfare, which is um, a general subject, but grows out of his experience with, uh, with what we've been talking about, Muslims living under oppression and um, the spiritual uh, bondage that Islam is. Uh, also, there are books, uh, I mentioned in the comments section too, uh, there are, that Mark has written a number of books. Some of them are very popular level, some of them are a little more technical. Um, maybe this is just a little quick question from me. Uh, you're, you've written a book on the relationship between the Quran and the Bible. Could you just give us a, a quick couple of minute insight into that and, and why that matters and how that plays out? Um, yes, if you want to find out more information about my books, markdury.com. I've just put it up on my name there. You can look that up. Well, Islam claims that um, the biblical figures were all Muslims. Jesus was a Muslim. Abraham was a Muslim. And it has a lot of biblical material in the Quran. There's a lot of references to the Bible. And I was asking 
what is all the Bible doing there? You know, what is Islam doing with all that material? And basically in this book, it's a, it's a complex argument, but in a nutshell, what I said is that basically Islam takes lots of bits and pieces from the Bible, but without comprehending those, how they fit together. It's as if a, a church was demolished or a synagogue was demolished. And then someone came along and said, oh, there's great building materials here. And they built a completely different building. And someone from the old church came in, they said, oh, I recognize that, I recognize that, that used to be in the front of the church, that used to be here. So you say, gee, there's a lot of church in this mosque. <laughs> but actually, the design of the mosque is completely different, its function is different. So I was arguing in this book that um, not only does the Bible preach a very different God from the God of the Quran, but all the theology is different as well. And uh, don't be deceived by the similarities. You need to go deeper to understand the differences and to assume there's a sort of family resemblance between the Quran and the Bible is really profoundly misleading and it falls into a kind of Islamic trap. So this book was about digging deep to explain the very big differences between the two faiths. Right. And again, this reinforces the need to understand where Muslims are coming from. So that, that's a common thing too, in my experience, that Muslims... Muslims too on the street think there's a there's a they think the same thing. There's a huge similarity between Christianity and Islam, but their prophets are our prophets, and their Jesus is our Jesus basically, and um, and there's hardly any difference. So they don't, can't quite understand the fuss. Yes, they they Islam sort of teaches that Islam is the pure Christianity and the pure right. Judaism, and Christians and Jews sort of started out as Muslims but lost their ways. So. Their message is come back to the truth, come back to the truth of your religion by becoming a Muslim. And to counter that, it's really helpful to be equipped with these, these sorts of resources. And, um, you know, it's a privilege to be teaching at MST and we have some great staff in this area as well. There's Dr. Richard Schumacher, who, who has a, a background in philosophy as an expert on, on Islam and philosophy, which is a fantastic resource. And Dr. Dennis as well has uh, had a lot of experience in working among Muslims and 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 teachers on the program too. So it's a fantastic um, resources here. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And in fact, that's probably a good lead in. We're, we've only got a minute or two left, and um, I might mention too. Yeah, Mark is right. We have on faculty. So there's um, Dennis Sevoyev and there's myself and Mark who are. Uh, faculty, faculty, but we have agile faculty, we have Bernie Power, um, we have a range of people who can uh, supervise projects, understanding Islam across a whole range of different disciplines. Uh, it's a great uh, resource that we have, um, as well as all the other uh, disciplines, multidisciplinary uh, work that we can do at MST. MST is strong in missiology. Um, I do work with Tom Kimber in the missiology department and with David Eng in, the, uh, in global leadership. Uh, Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure you. having you with us. Um, maybe if I could just have a quick prayer for you and your ministry, that would be great. And for everyone who's listening, Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to um, understand a bit about Islam and its place in the world, and particularly all the cool things that you're doing, the way that you're at work, the way Muslims are coming to faith in Christ. I want to thank you for Mark and his teaching, his equipping, his... Uh, the anointing that's on his ministry, the way you've been using him. Uh, we pray for the, for MST and the Arthur Jeffrey Centre as well. Thank you that you've uh, sustained and provided a place where Christians can uh, learn how to engage Islam at all levels, mis mis missionally and socially, um, even politically. Um, please bless that. I want to pray for any person here today who's on this seminar that are considering um, ministry in a Muslim context uh, or even just knowing how to be able to speak about Jesus to their neighbour, uh, that, that you would lead them to the resources that they need. Um, Heavenly Father, thanks for this time. It's been great. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, in the last 30 seconds we have, uh, let me uh, just point you to in the direction of Iona. Iona is part of our MST enrolment team. And if there's any follow-up you'd like to have about finding out more about uh, the Arthur Jeffrey Centre or any units that we teach on Islam, um, please talk to her.